A.K. Ramajan. Please welcome to the stage Guillermo Rodriguez in conversation with Arshia Sitar and Philip A. Lutgendorf. Thank you. Thank you and welcome everyone to this panel, um, which is uh, devoted to the uh, life and work and especially the poetry of A.K. Ramanujan. And um, we're going to begin, I'm going to read a very short poem uh, by Raman. And I should say that the, the um, reason that what has generated this panel is this new book, uh, by Guillermo Rodriguez. Can I get the uh, camera to zero in on this? Um, when Mirrors Are Windows, full title, The Poetic... A View on A.K. Ramanujan's Poetics. A View on, on A.K. Ramanujan's Poetics, published by Oxford University Press. Is it, is it showing on the screen? No, it's not. Can you zoom in on this? Is it, is it not possible? There it is. OK, now, can you, can you focus in on the book? We were told that this was going to be possible. But things don't always turn out the way, you know. No? OK, anyway. And here's the back cover, a nice, nice picture of Raman. So um, I'm going to begin by reading um, the poem that uh, inspired uh, Guillermo. So Guillermo Rodriguez, the author of the book, is one of our panelists. And this is a very uh, uh, extended and, and in-depth study of Ramanujan's poetics, primarily of his English poetry but it does also get into um, issues of translation and some of his wider uh, output. By Guillermo Rodriguez of uh, Valladolid, Spain, who became, well, you'll tell us how you became so interested in Ramanujan. Um, and Arsha Sattar, um, who I think many of you know as a translator from Sanskrit. Um, uh, she and I were graduate students together at the University of Chicago. Uh, in the 1980s. Uh, both of us had the privilege of studying with Ramanujan uh, for quite a long time. I was on again, off again, a student of his from 1978 until 1986. And he was the chair of my PhD committee. Uh, and Arsha was, what years were you? 84 to 90, so she kind of came af right after me. Um, so, and both of us are going to reminisce a little bit about uh, our experiences with, with Ramanujan and then uh, go to Guillermo and ask him about his work. But let me begin with this poem. Uh, and the poem is called Self Portrait um, from his, uh, was that his first book of English poetry, The Striders, published in 1966. 1966. Uh, the poem Self-Portrait. I resemble everyone but myself and sometimes see in shop windows, despite the well-known laws of optics, the portrait of a stranger, date unknown, often signed in a corner by my father. So, with that, um, we will we will uh, begin the panel. Um, Arsha, you want to? Would you like to talk a little bit about your reminiscences of Ramanujan? Well, um, my favorite story about Ramanujan um, actually is not something that he did, but um, in I think 80, 1988 or 1989. He was um, looking to go to uh, University of California at Berkeley. They were trying to buy him away from Chicago. And so there was this big turmoil in the department. You know, everybody's like, oh, Raman is leaving. Raman will leave. Raman this, Raman that. 
And um, Wendy Doniger, who was his colleague in the department, um, she wrote this letter to the dean or the provost or whoever it is, or the president, I don't know who it was. Um, it was sort of like you have to let Ramanujan stay. Ramanujan has to stay. And she gave it to me to give to the office. And I was walking to campus, and I saw that the letter was open. So I said, this is too good. I have to read it. <laughs> I have to read how... Uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, so Ramanujan was our teacher. He was a poet. He was a translator. He was a great scholar. He was an intellectual. Um, he was just a wonderful man. So anyway, so I sneakily opened the letter. And it said all kinds of things. I know. It's been 25 years now. You know, there's a statute of limitations. I cannot be arrested for this felony, um, this misdemeanor. Anyway, so I opened the letter and blah, 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 blah. But this, the, um, the sentence that I will never forget, Wendy Doniger, the great Wendy Doniger, says of her colleague, Ramanujan is the jewel in the crown of South Asian studies at Chicago. You cannot pluck him out. So I've never forgotten that. Um, I, remember, I remember Raman surprisingly often. I mean, uh, he, was, um, he could be quite distant sometimes, um, mainly because he lived inside his own head so much. So sometimes, you know, he'd walk past you and not say hello, and you'd say, oh, he doesn't like me. But that, that wasn't true, I don't think. But I remember him particularly when um, I do my Ramayana work, because he was on my dissertation committee. Um, and he was the first one who suggested, uh, why don't you translate Ramayana? Because I had to translate lar large passages of Ramayana from, for my dissertation. And he said, why don't you translate the text? And I, Wendy, who was the chair of my dissertation committee, I went to her in tears. I said, he wants me to be a translator. He thinks I'm not smart enough. I'm not a scholar. You know, and so, and of course, by the time I published my translation of the Ramayana, he, um, he wasn't with us anymore. He, he died in 94. Um, so I, I, I think of him often when I when I read Ramayana. Oh, Mike, yeah. Um, actually, his dates are 1929 to 1993. Oops. We stand corrected, but um, yeah, I just a few personal reminiscences from me. Um, it says something about Raman's kind of mind and his kind of genius that he was the chair of my dissertation committee because I work on Hindi, which is a language that Raman didn't know. And my dissertation is all about the performance traditions uh, of the Tulsidas uh, Ram Charitmanas, the, the, the great Hindi Ramayana 16th century of Tulsidas. Um, but Raman was um, the person who really kind of gave me the structure to think about the different kinds of performance genres that I had studied. He just had such a wide-ranging intellect and brilliant mind. And in one short afternoon, in the middle of my field work, I, I was in Benares uh, doing field work for a year. And uh, he came to India for some reason and was in Delhi. And I went in to visit him. And in one sort of session of about two hours sitting on a balcony in Defense Colony, um, I laid out to him what I had done so far. And I had all this great material I had collected. I was rich, lots of recordings of Katha and Ram Leela and Ramayan Gana and, you know, Pat. But I didn't have a way to sort of pull it all together. And Raman, just in his very kind of playful, innocent way, uh, he said, oh, well, you just, you just do this. This will be the first chapter, and this will be the second chapter. And, this. and all of a sudden, it was all there. And, uh, you know, it just all kind of came together. And I, that was, I, I wrote it. He, he essentially gave me the outline of my dissertation in this one conversation. He, he had that ability. And um, when I first proposed my project, I came up with the title, The Life of a Text. My, the Life of a Text. It's all about the performance of the Ram Charitmanas. And I, I remember showing the project, uh, the, the project proposal to Raman in the hall in, our, in the building where he taught at Chicago. And I remember him looking at it and saying, The Life of a Text. I can see that on a book. And at that point, you know, I was a 
graduate student just beginning my PhD work. That meant so much to me. Wow, Raman thinks this could become a book. And it did. And 10 years later, the University of California Press published The Life of a Text, and I gave one of the first copies to Raman, and, and I wrote on the inside, to Raman, you saw it first. Yeah. So I think with that, yeah, did you want to? Yeah, I just wanted to add mm. to, uh, you know, Raman had this capacity um, to just, you know, see structures and um, uh, it was like magic. He had, a, he had a sort of special vision. And I remember when, you know, I'd write chapters of my dissertation and give them to him because everybody has to read chapters from your dissertation. And Wendy would respond at great length and she said, do this and do that. And Ramanujan would keep like the chapter for a month. Right? And then there was this squiggly, squiggly, squiggly handwriting all over it. And I said to Wendy, like, he's not responding. Look, he writes so little, and I don't think he's interested in my dissertation. And she said to me, she said, darling, Raman is like the ant that shits gold. He'll give you very little, but whatever he gives you will be invaluable. So when I had to write the obituary for him in 1993 I, uh, for the Illustrated Weekly, I wrote, um, the man who shits gold. And I was a little worried that people might take it amiss, but I think everybody was just so upset that we'd lost him that, you know, people did So with that, I think we will turn to actually the, our main speaker here, who is Guillermo. Um, and I would like uh, you to t uh, tell us, as a person living in Spain, how did you become so interested in, fascinated by, even obsessed with, uh, A.K. Ramanujan's uh, poetic work. Thank you, Philip. Um, well, as um, every book is a journey, and um, yeah, so I want to talk about this journey a little bit, and then I want to talk about Ramanujan's journey also, which I describe in the book, uh, because that's maybe a journey the other way around. So, in some way, they cross. Uh, though I never met him. Um, I happened to arrive in India the same month that he passed away. Unfortunately, he passed away at the age of, you know, 64. And uh, it was just an accidental under, you know, underwent surgery and it was the anesthetic. So it was a bit, huge loss. It was a huge loss. And uh, uh, even, uh, you know, uh, people like uh, Anantamurti wrote an obituary saying, you know, the, the importance of being Ramanujan, why he was so important. But we come back to that. Let me just tell you very briefly, yeah, the story. So, um, you know, when you're a 21, 22 year old student, I was studying stylistics at Edinburgh after having left from Spain. And, um, you know, this kind of self search that um, I'm not part of the hippie movement of the 60s or 70s, but there was another, you know, kind of wave in the early 90s. So I just had it, uh, to, I said, I want to go to India. And uh, just to discover something new, I had already traveled all over Europe and I just want to go east. And uh, it wasn't really something special, it's just to know the other, other cultures. And, and my wife, Monica, who's here with me now, uh, you know, we both traveled over Europe, Iran, Turkey, and ended up in, uh, in the north of India. Uh, she found, uh, uh, you know, something that, um, you know, talked to her in, in the dance, and I found it in the poetry. Because, you know, when you, when you come from a different culture, and that maybe holds true to anyone who is of that age, you're looking for something and you're trying to f understand yourself, which is again about identity. I resemble everyone but myself because it's just like you see so many things that are uh, like a mosaic echoing in mirrors in yourself but you don't know what you are and you may, sometimes you see it more clearly when you, when you see the other. So I, I we went to Benares and I bought uh, two books there at a bookshop, incidentally just by chance owned by a Spaniard at Godolia, at Godolia Crossing. And one was 10 Indian English Poets. It's this anthology by, by Partha Sarathi. And the other one was um, uh, Speaking of Shiva, uh, which was Ramanjan's translations. And G oh, Girish Karnat's also uh, Hayavadana. So I just, just picked up some books. And um, this was in 92 or 93, uh, 93, the same year. So I started reading all of these poets, but for some reason, uh, Ramanujan's poems are, you know, magic. They have these layer. They have this quality of making you reread them, and it has so many layers. He used to say that poems haunted him, but I have to say that these poems they, they just kept haunting me, 
and uh, I had to reread them again. A lot of the uh, poems, if you have read the, you know, some of them are imagistic, and they're like Chinese, you know, kind of boxes, and they have all these layers. And then later I understood a little bit because he he was interested in magic as a boy, so he used to play magic tricks, and of course uh, with you know, what's the tool a poet uses to do the magic? It's language, and he became a linguist, and he was very, he was trained to use language as, as, as an object, as an object, very clinical, of course, influenced by William Carlos Williams and all these people. So to end this story on, on how I got involved, so I just picked up this book, um, Monica bumped into Alamed Valley at Kajuraho Festival and said, I want to dance with you, and Alamed Valley said, well, um, come to Madras. So we went to Madras, and um, she, uh, you know, uh, was told to go to Kalakshetra because Alan Wali was at the peak of her career. She wouldn't teach. So she got admitted to Kalakshetra, got a scholarship. We ended up at Cholamandal Artist Village, which is where he held his first re uh, last reading in India. His last poetry reading in December took place there. And I was able to join um, Loyola College uh, and do a, an MA on... Uh, you know, Indian writing in English. And the professor asked me, so you have to write a dissertation. What do you want to write it on? And uh, I chose one poem, Snakes, the poem Snakes. I was just haunted by that poem. Uh, and the whole dissertation, 150 pages, was on that one single poem from a thematic perspective and from a linguistic perspective, stylistic perspective. Because it has all, and this explains the identity of Ramanujan also. You have the South Indian echoes, and in that you take one single, that the magic of Ramanujan is you take one single poem of his, and you can extract, even with this poem which you just, you just read, his entire uh, aesthetics or poetics out of one poem. You have all the layers there, in you know, the South Indian connotations of the snake, coming to, you know, give it uh, milk to the snake in that poem, and then the braid with the, uh, the hair of the woman, the moon, the, the kundalini, and then also the biblical, uh, you know, undercurrent is also there. So you have the, the, the deshi, he was, a, he was a multicultural, he grew up in Mysore, was a Kannada speaker, of course, but of Tamil parents, who he didn't have training in formal Tamil, so he had this dialogue in him already there. Plus, as he said, you know, the famous metaphor of the house, where in the kitchen he would hear all the oral stories, and then the mother tongue and the father tongue, and in the attic, uh, it was astronomy as well as astrology in Sanskrit and English. So in that one single poem, you have all those layers, and it just kept haunting me. And I, start, I said, I want to do research on Ramanujan, and so talk to everyone who knew him in, in Bangalore at the time. And then Girish Karnat said, after three, four years, uh, well, you've already... Uh, met everyone who, who knew him in India and I said I want to do a PhD on him. I joined Kerala University because of Ayapa Panikar who was a little envious of somebody like Ramanujan. You know, a lot of people were envious him because he had made it to America. Let's not forget, at the age of 30, Ekar Ramanujan went into linguistics, got tired of learned teaching Shakespeare in India, got a scholarship and ended up in America where he became a famous professor. So Girish Khanat said, you have to go to Chicago. That's where he taught. You know, just go and see and, uh, some of the people there and research, research the papers. So I ended up going to special collections. Molly Ramanujan, his ex-wife, had, you know, submitted all the work, all the papers, boxes, like 30 feet long material. And there were all his diaries and unpublished material, the way he had handed it over. Not in the processed manner. Now it's in folders, in sub by subjects. Just the way it, he had left it there. And suddenly I read all of his diaries in his life, and you know, it's just like uh, he was aware of that somebody would read his diaries at a time. And and I, you know, I had to write this book. I've been told I should not be too passionate. He told me don't become too passionate about things. But uh, anyway, that's the start. You, you are passionate, Guillermo, and, and I appreciate that. And um, you, you. Yes, please. Uh, no, I have my own. Um, so somebody in Bangalore who uh, didn't know uh, Ramanujan, um, I think he was reviewing the book or something, and he called me to say, did you know Ramanujan took acid? And I was like, no. 
Why would I know that? He said, is there any corroboration proof that he actually got high? And I was like, listen, I was 24 years old. I was a graduate student. He was doing acid. He wasn't doing it with me. But I got, I, I, it made, for me, it made Ramanujan all the cooler that he had actually, you know, because as you say in your book, Nisim Ezekiel was experimenting with drugs and Ramanujan had at least one trip that he um, wrote about. Well, uh, you know, uh he was a very uh, anxious and troubled mind. He called himself the, again, so coming back to Anantamurti, why the importance of being Ramanujan, no? Uh, he called himself the hyphen in Indo-American studies. And at a time when uh, mainly Sanskrit studies were part of Indology at American universities, we're talking of the late 50s, early 60s, he brought in, no, it was not just him, but he was one of the leaders of, bringing in South Indian Dravidian studies into the milieu of academic, uh, you know, serious work in, in, in the US. So he became a bridge between the ancient traditions of South India and Dravidian studies and, um, you know, the American, the Western reader. Uh, that was part of his crucial asset. He said he wanted to translate the reader, not the, the text. So why do I say that? Because he was, he was caught culturally also between these two, you know, he used to travel a lot back and forth. But of course, um, and we come to, back to him as a translator and scholar, because I only discovered later about his essays, they were not published. I just fell in love with his poems and with his translations, the famous, you know, translations of the Vira Shaiva, um, uh, speaking of Shiva is about Akama, Devi, Vasavana, and all these poets, medieval poets in Canada. And then the Sangam tradition, which is older, Akam and Puram, inner and outer aesthetic, and then the Alvars. So, but of course, he was also part, or he wanted to be part, uh, you know, of the American uh, column, you know, not exactly the beat generation, of course, because that was earlier, but he was a modernist poet. And he was a modern or contemporary uh, man uh, who uh, had always shunned uh, his tradition uh, or, you know, the Brahminical background. So he, uh, interesting story, when he was 16, he threw away his sacred thread. He renounced Brahmanism, and he was always critical of his own tradition and the Marga tradition. So he had this very difficult relationship with his father, and this also, you know, obsession with, with, with the mother, the Oedipal kind of relationship. So he went through all these rebellious movements, and that's why he discovered the Vira Shaiva counterculture. He had always been interested in, uh, you know, the, uh, the subaltern, before the subaltern was called subaltern, oral tales, the oral, he traveled all over the place studying oral women's studies, female oral tales, and always, you know, the other way of looking at things. And he had always been inspired, you know, or to some extent by Aldous Huxley. He went to see the Charles Darwin, at the Charles Darwin Centennial uh, Celebrations, 1959. He had only been in the US for a few months. He wanted to, uh, you know, listen to Aldous Huxley, and he bumped into Ed Dimmock. So, so Huxley had always been there. And when he went through, because everybody was doing, you know, uh, some sort of drugs uh, as, a, as, a, as a cultural lifestyle in the West. And, you know, that experiment, Aldous Huxley and Timothy Leary with, 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 with mescaline. So, as I said, he was a troubled mind, and in, he got divorced in a, you know, early 70s, 71. He went through a big crisis. And uh, among some of his folk tales, <laughs> I think he hidden it, had hidden it away, because sometimes Molly used to read his diaries. He says, you're not going to read my next diary. I will keep two, two diaries, one for you to read and one not for you. So I found this masculine notes where he, he himself, without another psychoanalyst or anyone sitting next to him, you know, he just had this trip and he started writing. And he said, so I'm stepping in uh, Aldous Huxley's footsteps. And he starts writing these, these amazing visual impressions. And then, uh, of course, he didn't believe that this would inspire poems. He believed in grace in a much, uh, you know, in a different way, that the, the ordinary is the mystical. And you, you should not, but he became obsessed with the notion of Soma some elixir, some concept of that something should inspire you. So it's very much there, and the masculine notes are there, and a lot of poems could be, uh, you know, kind of traced to that experience. Um, so 
I would like you to talk a little bit about, and also Arsha, um, about his significance as a, a poet, as an Indian poet, both uh, a poet who wrote in English and a poet who wrote in Kannada, and, and the particular situation that he had. Uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I would just start speaking about, because he was, bi he was a bilingual poet, uh, both in English and Kannada, of course, in Kannada, part of the Navya movement. Uh, which is the new poetry. Um, I'm not sure what is the scenario now in India, but it all, when, at the time, even in, in the 90s, early 90s, uh, when you did uh, li you know, English Literature BA or MA, there was uh, either, it was either called New Literatures in English or Commonwealth Literature, Post-Colonial Literature, I don't know what it's called now, but it's Post-Truth Literature. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> today. I don't know what it's called now. But he was a figure within that, uh, you know, Nisim Ezekiel, Kamala Das, uh, the poets that wrote in English, Partha Sarati, who um, most of them were English professors or had, of course, a direct... Kane Darawal was not. I, I believe he was, a, he, was a, he was part of the civil service. He was around, by the way. Merotra, Adil Jasawala. So, of course, and that's why he was part of the 10 Indian English poets. He was part of, became part of the canon of uh, modern Indian poetry in English. As a modernist, uh, in, you know, in the 90s he was already recognized as a modernist. Most of his poems could belong, you know, could, you could say they belonged to the modernist. You know, modernism as influenced by T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, William Carlos Williams, and all those guys but also with some touches of French surrealism and a little bit of beat, uh, you know, influence. Now, there's something wrong about that also, that interpretation, because we should not forget that these poems, you know, they, they're not stuck somewhere in time. In his aesthetics, he's also very romantic because of the influence of the... He, he wanted to, you know, he, did, he was very much influenced by T.S. Eliot and his theory uh, and the tr theory of translation of Pound, but... The relevance is, and he was one of the pioneers, is if you write in English, it's not just the English that is in the background, but the entire tradition. He believed, you know, the metaphor of the sita? You play the sita, and there's the, the other strings, sympathetic strings that, that resound in the background. So, so when you play a note, like in the sita, there's this whole other resounding tradition around you. And he wanted to inscribe his poetry in English in the Indian tradition, where uh, uh, not necessarily in the modernist Western tradition, both. He wanted to be part of both. Um, so I don't think that he has achieved uh, only the test of time, and I say that in the book, whether he will be recognized as an, as an English poet in his own right, as part of the modernist American. No, he wanted to be part of that also. But he... he very much wanted to inscribe his work, and that's why he made also these poems, mock poems, ironic poems on prayers to Lord Murugan. You know, he's playing around with the tradition. And he was the first to accept and absorb these other layers, and very importantly, encouraged other poets, like Jasawala, like Parthasarati, Nisim Ezekiel to some extent, because I think Nisim, yeah, he was older, to translate because the translation would enrich their own poetries. The understanding of that tradition would enrich their poems. So I think he was so, important, you know, so conscious about being part of tradition. And, and I think, you know, because he said, you don't write poetry in a vacuum. You know, it's, it's all there. Like, just like I resemble everyone but myself. So it has to resonate. Poetry resonates within a tradition. And I think he was the first one to steer that way and to encourage others to do so. In Canada, I mean, I'll speak in borrowed words because I don't read Canada. But recently, I have a lot of friends. In, I live in Bangalore, um, who have been deeply influenced by Ramanujan as, as uh, uh, poets and writers themselves. And recently, um, on uh, um, in the week of his death anniversary last year, we had a remembrance for him. And Vivek Shanbagh was there, um, and of course, Vivek himself is a very fine writer in Canada. And he was saying that Ramanujan in Kannada was so fresh 
right? And so new, and he's definitely a modern in Canada. I mean, that is, that's without a doubt. And he made it possible for other Canada poets to write differently because of the work that he had done. And Vivek, you know, being a writer himself, he said this wonderful thing. He says, you know, when Ramanujan puts words in a sentence, the words they talk to each other, it's like a conversation, and their meaning changes. Raman uses words like nobody else does. And I was very struck by that, and I think that sort of carries over into his English poetry as well. Like you were saying, a snake is not a snake, you know? Um, it's all kinds of, of other things, yeah. And of course, uh, he had these haiku-like poems, a lot of them in Kannada, and imagistic poems. But that's only just one phase. We also have to understand that the man lived till 1993. So what happened in the 80s with post-structuralism, and that happened to a number of, and he was a scholar. So he was certainly aware that uh, poetry was going to th through changes. And if you read his poems in his last collection of uh, Second Sight, 19, published in 1986, which is a combination of old material he had, and a lot of new materials. There's this, this long poem he had written called Composition, and which is based on the Tamil Kural, you know, like two lines and then another line clinches another on a, on a Tamil, uh, you know, prosody, prosodic form. Um, it's, it's interesting to see how he chopped it into pieces because he always believed, you know, I believe truth is only in fragments. And, but very Deridian also, Derrida. It's full of bards and Derrida. If you, you know, if you read his uh, work of the 1980s, it's post-structuralist. But interestingly, he threw into it some of the poems he, he had written in the 50s and 60s, maybe to confuse the, the reader, I don't know. But he, a lot of that work is definitely post-structuralist, post-modernist, not just modernist. You just have to get and, you know, scratch at the surface and you will see a lot of he's into, you know, text as body, text as tissue, he was obsessed with the body and that's why he was doing bioenergetics and in psychoanalysis, you know he's, his, his diaries are full of dream stories, initially he was just writing diary as a young scholar like everybody, you know when you keep a diary, you just keep a diary but when the diary becomes a part of the therapy his psychoanalyst said, you should write a diary. And part of a writing methodology. Keep a diary, whatever dream comes to your mind, and then it may become a poem, if grace comes upon you. <laughs> because he believed they were like, you know, poems were like babies. You have to, you know, the, sometimes they don't, they never get born. They're just halfway caught in between, only embryo. And when they get born, you have to clean them up, you know, and... <laughs> Uh, yeah, keep them nice and sm they have to smell you know, nice. Wash the blood Wash off. Wash them and they have to grow and you have to nurture them and then they sometimes scream at you and they can become monsters. There are a lot of poems in there, you know, that are haunting and are monsters because he was afraid of his poems also and afraid of not being able to write a poem again. Yeah. So, so there are a lot of animal poems, they're, you know, fear poems I call them, you know, haunting poems. There, there are so many different facets to his work, and I just want to mention something that Arsha touched on very briefly, which was his work as a folklorist. Um, besides being a linguist, he was a wonderful folklorist, and his great love was uh, Kannada folklore. And he did very serious ethno ethnography and collecting of tales, which eventually became two collections. I know one is called The Flowering Tree, Wonderful, wonderful collection of, of Kannada folk tales, including a lot of women's tales. Uh, very beautiful stories. And then he did the other big anthology of Indian folk tales, which was drawn, drawn from all over the country. I, I think it's just called Indian folk tales. Folk tales from India. Thank you. From yeah. Thank you, Sharon. Yeah. And of course, he brought his poetic sensibility to the way he wrote down. Uh, all of these, uh, or translated all of these things. Um, I, so I want to turn to the question of translation now and, and put this to uh, Guillermo. Um, I, I kind of want to invite you to think about how did Ramanujan's uh, sensibility and his aesthetic as an English poet, which you've talked about, um, affect his translation work? Because, you know, Raman is famous for introducing basically pre-modern 
Dravidian literature to an international audience. I mean, speaking of Shiva, uh, the interior landscape, hymns for the drowning, these books ignited a passion for Tamil and Kannada uh, in a whole generation of scholars who subsequently learned these languages and, and uh, you know, became scholars of South Asia focusing on the South. Um, so, on the other hand, particularly since his death, some of his translation work has come in for a lot of criticism, um, particularly from people within the Kannada community. And so I just, I wanted you to kind of uh, think about that a bit. Well, the first thing we have to understand that, uh, and this is, if you want the thesis of the book, is that he, he thought, wrote, and even dreamt. He was as a poet. I mean, that runs through, it's the axis of his life, his poetry. And the way he observed the particular, the way he just lived, he lived as a poet, an artist. And in a way, the book is a homage to Ramanji, but it's also um, um, homage to the act of writing, the, uh, the, the aesthetic act, the act of being, uh, you know, uh, just a medium of making an artwork, you know, happen. And it, that's the right way it happened. So he believed that only a poem can translate a poem. Only a poem can translate a poem. And he was the perfect blend. As I said, he was, he was a poet in his own right in English. He was writing you know, poetry in English from a young age. Uh, around, it was around when he, you know, when he was 17, he failed a history exam. And his father said he wa his father wanted him to become a mathematician. And he said, no, 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 I think you're not good enough. So he took one year off. And that one year, he t just took off from uh, high school uh, before going to college, you know, it was crucial because he started scribbling poems first in Canada, then in English. And uh, however, why do I mention that? Because mathematics, there was always this thirst for science was still lingering there. His father was a famous ma mathematician. By the way, he is called Ramanujan after the famous Srinivas Ramanujan because his father knew Srinivas Ramanujan. They went both to Pachayapakas College. They met there. and. He, his father admired Srinivas Ramanujan and he called his second son Ramanujan. So interesting how the, even in his name, the mathematics is there. So this thirst for science after having teaching for eight or nine years, uh, you know, English at, you know, Belgaum and Baroda, other places, made him join linguistics in Pune. And that was the master stroke because somebody like him who had already absorbed these traditions, uh, learning linguistics, he just fell in love with linguistics. It was like somehow it, it matched his thirst and it was a way of getting into the science of language because what is linguistics but the science of language? And let us, re you know, we have to remember that early 1960s, it was uh, the time when Saussure and Jacobson became very big in the US, you know, structuralism as, you know, the new critical thinking, linguistics was part of this. Literary criticism was born in that way, as you looking at linguistics. Uh, so he was important, and he had very important uh, teachers like Stankiewicz, and he was at Iowa and other, you know, in interest, important places. So his, his, his PhD is on Kannada grammar, in fact. So he had started playing around with the Virashaga poems, but he didn't understand them. He didn't, he called them transcreations. He didn't call them translations. Only later when he studied Dra, you know, Dravidian language in a scientific manner, like Tamil, uh, would he apply his linguistic knowledge, you know, as a translator? And here comes the dilemma, because translation as a metaphor in his life is, is a crucial metaphor. Tra to translate, you know, metaphor means to translate in Greek, metaphor, to carry across. So his life was a, consti a continu continuous carrying across. But he said you have to strike the balance between representation and appropriation, between the subject and the object, you know, between uh, the phrases, let poetry win without allowing scholarship to lose. And another beautiful phrase which he took from uh, Krauss, from an Austrian uh, philosopher is, uh, a, a, you know, a, a translator is an artist on oath. You have to be faithful to the to the original, but you have to make the poem work. 
And I think what I t when I interact with you know, some critics who are not so happy with some of the translations, I always tell them, look, he was translating for the Western reader in America. He took this tradition and brought it over and spilled it in, you know, in beautiful poems, of course in the modernist mode. You know, of course. And they had such a strong impact. You know, uh, because the, the, he was not writing for the urban intellectual in Bangalore. He was writing for American readers. He could have done, some, he would have done maybe something different in the 90s. You have to look at him within that context, the 60s, the 70s, uh, you know, 80s also. He was translating for the Western reader and he was tra translating the reader as well as the text, the context. But I think that had also become his idiom after 30 years in America, that he had become an urban American intellectual, you know, so that was his voice by then. But, you know, Phil, uh, I mean, he must have influenced your translation in some way. Phil is translating Ram Charit Manas Tulsidas for the Murthy uh, Classical Library, and one volume is already out, right? Two, two volumes are out. So do you, I mean, do you feel Raman when you translate? Because I, I do very, very much. There's a, there's a story there, um, and um, we only have about five minutes before we go to the little recording and then Q&A, but um, when Raman died, you know, as, as it was mentioned, he died very unexpectedly, very suddenly. He went into the hospital for what was supposed to be a routine surgery, and then he had a, a kind of an allergic reaction to the anesthetic. And before they even started the operation, he, his heart stopped. Um, so it was a huge shock to everybody who knew him. And although he was, what, 64? He was 64, but he looked like he was about 50. And, you know, everybody assumed he was going to be around for a very long time. So I was, and I was at that time already in, in, at the University of Iowa teaching, you know, basic courses on, on Ramayana and Mahabharata as well as Hindi language. And it was a tremendous shock to me. I went into Chicago for the memorial service um, and uh, I came back um, and I woke up one morning, and I had never considered myself a literary translator. Um, I translated some verses from the Manas for my book, but they were purely illustrative, you know, to illustrate various points. And I never thought of myself as a literary translator. And, but I woke up one morning with this kind of weird feeling of like, well, Raman, who I idolized and who I considered the model translator, is gone now. Who's going to do it? You know, uh, and I thought, well, maybe I should go back to this text, which I have become so close to and which I care about, and just try to do something. You know, I was aware of, of, of the existing English translations and why I didn't like them. And I, I wanted to try to do something different. And so, I, and I said to myself, um, I'm not going to show this to anybody. I'm just doing this for, my, for myself. As Tulsi Das would say, Swanta Sukhaya. He, he's, he says in the, in the opening Sanskrit benediction, he's, he's writing this for his own inner satisfaction. Um, and, you know, this is just, I'm just fooling around. I'm just kind of trying to think like Raman. And I sat down at my computer and I, I did maybe one doha, one stanza. Um, and then the next day I did another one. And I, did, I kept this up for quite a while, a couple of weeks. And then I, and only then did I go back and reread. And I, and I said, you know, oh, this is sort of, this is, some of this is not so bad, right? And at that point, the telephone rang. And it was another scholar, Indira, Indira Vishwanathan Peterson, a very uh, distinguished translator from Tamil. And she said, Phil, have you ever thought about translating the Ramcharit Manas? And I said, well, gee, it's funny. It's funny that you should ask because I've been doing it for a couple of weeks. And, and she said, well, I'm doing this new edition of the Norton Anthology of World Masterpieces, and it's never included anything except Sanskrit from India. And I think there should be vernacular works in it. And I want a, a section from the Manas. So I, I then was commissioned to translate Sundarkand uh, for the Norton Anthology. And that was my first stab at, at doing it. And I dedicated it to, to Raman. 
And it was published in, um, in, in a, part of it was published in the Norton Anthology, and then um, the Sahitya Academy mag uh, magazine, Indian Literature, published the whole, the whole thing. So, yeah, it's so it inspired uh, me directly. But you know, it's so funny, um, because I think that there was, I mean, all of us who had some exposure to Rama, I mean, of a particular generation, every single one of us is translating. And I think he taught us to be translators without ever actually saying, this is how you translate. It was many, many years later that I think Girish Karna told me, he said, do you know how Ramanujan used to translate? And I was like, actually, I don't. And he said that Raman would first start with a really, really impressionistic uh, response to the poem, and then he would narrow it and make it more and more literal and more and more literal and more and more literal. And once Karnad had pointed that out, I was like, oh, that's how I do it too. Not that I'm as great as Ramanujan, but something in his presence and something, the ease with which he, you know, was able to do this, I think we all just got it os osmotically that, oh yeah, or well, we did it for him, as you said, you know, who's going to do it now that he's not there, so. So I want to read uh, something on translation by Ramanujan. You know, that one phrase, um, yeah, from 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 uh, the book as well as the. You see, um, he called it. He called he called poetry writing the ordinary mystery. Uh, you know, as a poet is a specialist in what everyone does all the time. A poet is a specialist in what everyone does all the time. We all observe. You know, but you know we, the way a poet records it, and then, as the Russians say, the Russian formalists say, you just turn things around and look at it differently. So, so it's an ordinary mystery, and the combination of the mystic, the mystery, and the ordinary, also ironically in life, it comes out very well in in one of his poems, which I'm going to read, uh, uh, which talks about his theory of translation in a very ironic manner. Um, and uh, this will introduce uh, a little surprise we have ready for you. Uh, so the last stanza of this poem is Water Falls in a Bank, is the title of the poem. It's from Second Sight. It goes like this. As I transact with the past, as with another country, with its own customs, currency, stock exchange, always at a loss when I count my change. <laughs> as I transact with the past, as with another country, with its own customs, currency, stock exchange, always at a loss when I count my change. So, the last. Uh, and this is a very emotional moment. Uh, the last poetry reading he did in India was in Chennai, 92, um, at Chola Mandal Artist Village. He, somebody had asked him to translate some poems that were scribbled on the walls of a uh, temple. It's a temple outside Chennai. I think it's called Kalyan Temple. Nila Kalyan Temple where people get married 365 days uh, uh, and uh, a year, and uh, he just scribbled them down, translated them, and he brought them over and just spontaneously read them out to a group of friends at Cholna Mandal Artist Village. It, these are poems that are, uh, you know, of the tradition of the Alvar tradition, the immersed ones, the mystic poets of the South. And this is Tirumangai Alvar. Um, so can we play it, that piece? Because uh, it was given to me by Vishwanathan, the painter, and I had kept it for years there. And then I just discovered the tape again, and I played it, and it's just that, you know, it's just the, this Alvar and the, the Tamil culture comes to life in the poem. Yes. So we end the session with Tirumangai Alvar the, by A.K. Ramanujan himself. Aaron and she talks. Dollars was part of the original tape. To the devotees who say, Wizard, you took on the forms of swan, fish, tortoise, and man lion. Show me your grace. He shows his grace, our Lord of Vidalende. About him, the chieftain of Tirumangai town, with its great long standing buildings, our Arvar who carries a superb spear 
has sung these songs in his gifted voice. Anyone who sings them will wash off stains forever. Anyone who says so will wash off stains forever. So we have time for some questions or comments, if there are some. Lady in the front row. <laughs> so, as you know, I only knew Raman socially because he was so close to Ed Dimmick, and when I would come to Chicago to perform or visit Ed or here in India, we'd meet. My question, you mentioned about when California wanted to get him. I wanted to know, either from his diaries or from your experience, after he got the MacArthur, he found he couldn't get any work done for a year. That was like terrible, MacArthur Fellowship. And the other thing is he did go to University of Michigan for a year. They gave him a price he couldn't refuse, but then he wasn't getting any work done, so he came back. So I'm just wondering, either from the diaries that you read and from those things, was there any difference in his work after those episodes of the MacArthur or Ann Arbor? Wendy used to say the MacArthur destroyed Raman. I mean, she used to say, uh, you know, it really changed everything for him. Um, I don't think he knew what to do. Uh, but, you know, when we, um, this was a podcast, the, the poem, and I, um, and I didn't want to hear it because I didn't want to remember Raman so really. But when I heard it now, I, re I remembered another thing, that Ramanujan also taught us how to read poetry aloud. He was such a beautiful reader of poetry. I remember the first time I heard him read, it was Jibanandan Das, and Clint had done the, Clint Seely had done the translation, and it was, I heard it again now, he just reads. Well, uh, just to answer your question to some extent, um, you know he was twice divorced. So he married again in 74, then again divorced. I think the last few years of Ramanujan were very, very difficult. Um, he had a very strong relationship uh, with another woman who uh, was a student, who was a Tamil scholar as well. And he was actually, uh, he was living with, with her in the last phase of his life. And he had a very troubled, very tough, tough uh, last few years also because it was, part, you know, his, his illness, his pain, and a lot of his poems about pain. And I think it, it was very troubled in the last few years. It's, f it's ironic because in the 70s, he writes in his diaries, what a failed man, I have failed in my life. Everybody's made it big. Girish Khan has got all these awards and this and this. I'm not getting awards. Uh, I'm just writing. And 70s were also difficult, but then it became very creative. And, you know, I'm not getting recognition. He had this kind of anxiety. I'm not getting... And then he gets this huge award. But he was also very obsessed with money, in a way, in, with money, you know, how the money was used. So whenever, you know, I don't know. I've never won a million dollars in a lottery, but if I, I'm sure I'll have a lot of trouble if I, well, maybe not with a million, but with a hundred million. <laughs> so if you get such, how to manage, <laughs> how to manage this, this, this money and the, you know, the pools and, and then him being part of these pools and the politics of, of, you know, the family. So very, very difficult and getting this award may not have been good creatively for him. So maybe sh we should, you know, I don't know, this is the other side of getting awards. Yeah. Let's avoid awards. <laughs> Raman wrote in five languages, mainly Tamil, Telugu, Kannad, uh, Sanskrit and English, but he never wrote in Hindi. In his uh, poem, A River, uh, he used some Hindi words, but he never wrote in Hindi. What was the reason behind it? If he knew Sanskrit… He, he really didn't know Hindi. Um, and he, he really didn't know Sanskrit either, as far as I know, no. He, I mean, he was a South Indian and… Um, he, you know, he supervised my dissertation without being able to read any of the original text that I was that I was working on. Um, but my my but my study was really um, a, an ethnography of performance. It wasn't really about the text itself directly. So he could do that. Um, and of course, I had I had two Hindi scholars uh, on my dissertation committee as well. It wasn't just Ramanujan and also Wendy Doniger. So, but he didn't, he didn't know Hindi. Is that okay? Is that a, an answer your question? Yeah. 
Gilamo, sir, your take on 300 Ramayana, Ramayana's uh, essay by Ramanuj. I would like to hear from you because you have uh, read extensively. Um, yeah, well, I, I also have an essay in the same book that, that that came out in. It was published in a book called Many Ramayanas, uh, edited by Paula Richmond, that was published in 1991. And quite a few Ramayana scholars, uh, Velacheru Narayana Rao, one, his wonderful essay on women's uh, songs about the Ramayana are in that book. I wrote an essay about the Ram Rasika tradition. Um, but Raman's 300 Ramayanas was the one that got adopted in Delhi University uh, in, a, in one particular course, and that's the one that a political student group chose to make into a, into a big issue. I was very surprised because I thought it was a totally mild and unobjectionable and very appreciative uh, essay uh, if you have you read it, if you've read it, it's uh, you know there's I don't really see what would offend anybody in there, but of course if you believe that there's only one Ramayana, and there's one true version of the story, and everything else is wrong, then of course you would have a problem. And if you want to impose that view on, you know, 1.2 billion of your country people. Um, then you'll have a problem with that essay. But um, I think it's a beautiful essay, and it's very typical of Raman's little gem-like essays, full of insights and surprises, and uh, yeah. But it was taken out of the curriculum, as you know. One more question. Hi, so I know this is like a really basic question and honestly when you played the clip it, it really touched me. So my question is, why do you think he wrote? What, what was the purpose of poetry to him? What, what made him write? What inspired him? Like why did he do what he did in short? Okay, okay. so we'll end here. Just wanted to read. I let, Rama, I let Aki Ramajan respond to your question. The poems, when they come, surprise me. I feel a poem has chosen me, not me the poem. And this is not being mystical. I have the same feeling about thoughts, ideas, events, person, persons. Maybe a certain passivity, a need to say, I didn't work for it. I'm not responsible in my nature. For years, I took the Buddhist slogan, take nothing that's not given, literally. Except I reversed it to, take everything that's given, or say no to nothing, which landed me in dreadful dilemmas with food and women. <laughs> Yet, one works for grace in some secret way, works at it as one does at a poem that has come to you. Pasteur said, chance favors only the prepared. The prepared. Chance favors only the prepared, if you're prepared. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming this afternoon. Please thank Guillermo Rodriguez, Arisha Sattar, and Philip A. Lutgendorf one last time for the last session of the day here at Daba Hall. Um, also, the music event tonight will be Bombay Base Bassment and Inner Moja. If you're planning on heading there tonight, there will be tickets available from Hotel Clark's Amir and also from tent number two near the registration tent. The festival require, help, asks for your help to keep Diggy Palace and its environment clean, so please take your litter with you and please check your seat for any of your belongings before you leave today. We would also like to thank our other sponsors, Z Entertainment, who's our title partner, Cox and King's venue partner. We urge you to download Free Charge, who is helping the festival go cashless, or not so much anymore. Rajasthan Tourism, our tourism partner, Amity University, our university partner.